go. Awesome. Yeah, you guys can give a standing ovation. That's fine. You're welcome. And he's a looker too, y'all. How about that? Not bad. Manny, don't make me blush. I just got here. That's the whole point. The you whole point. buy me dinner first, right? Oh. Well, thankfully, there's a lot of good taquerias around here. We can. Uh, thank you guys for the warm welcome. So kind of you. How you doing? How you feeling? I'm good. I'm good. I'm feel better being here. Honestly, um, feels nice to be together with people in person. I miss this a lot the last two years. We were talking in my kitchen mm -hmm. just before this. We were having our little in our VIP reception by my hood uh, <laughs> my, and my oven about the last time we saw each other. Do you want to tell everyone where was the last time we uh, hung out? Yeah, we it's, were, a, it's an ironic story. So Manny and I actually met for the first time at the Wisdom 2.0 conference uh, here in the San Francisco Bay Area. And it was two years ago, two and a half years ago, just like when the pandemic was just beginning. And no one quite knew what to do at that time in terms of safety precautions. And so this is the very last event that I went to. And even at the event, people were trying to figure out, should we hug each other, shake hands or not? So people had decided that they would just do a namaste and not shake each other's hands. <laughs> but as Manny noticed, they weren't using hand sanitizer. It was just a time of confusion. And then, of course, days after that, everything rapidly shut down. I remember there was really good gum in the green room. I miss that. There was really good gum, really good snacks. I remember feeling very cool. And I spoke on a panel about the importance of in-person gathering <laughs> <laughs> around politics. And I got up on stage and I gave my whole spiel about the future. The future is not digital, people. The future is in-person. You want to look. You want to be able to touch and feel politics. And then it was like, never mind. Joke's on you two weeks later. And you, and what did you speak about? You were the keynote speaker, if I remember correctly. So also somewhat ironically, I was speaking about the, something that I was learning more and more about from people all across America, which was the power of social connection and the importance of focusing on our emotional health and well-being. And little did I know that the next one to two years would be a time of profound isolation for many people where we would not be able to see folks that we really cared about. And it was very ironic because Usually during times of stress, like what do we do? We pick up the phone and call someone we love. We go to see a friend or we hang out with our friends. But we can do that during one of the most stressful times in many people's lives. So um, let's, we're going to get into a lot of other stuff, but I wanted to dive right into the subject that I know you're working out very hard on right now, which is social isolation. I think your team call it social recession too, which I really want to know what that term means to you. But talk to me about this issue, what it means to you, what it is about. And then I want to ask you if you can tell us a little bit about how the issue has gotten worse over the last two years from what you see. Sure. So, you know, we're used to thinking about economic recessions and people are familiar with that term. But during the pandemic, and I would say even predating the pandemic, many people in our country and even around the world were experiencing an erosion in their relationships, in their sense of community. And I think of that as a social recession that has actually profound consequences for our health. So it turns out that people who struggle with loneliness uh, and isolation are a greater risk for uh, anxiety and depression, but also for physical health consequences like heart disease and premature death and dementia and sleep disturbances, and the list goes on. And once you understand the biology of loneliness and how it puts us into a chronic stress state uh, and a state of hypervigilance, you can start to understand why it has the mental and physical effects it does. But that social recession is one that we haven't really grappled with you know, as a country. And I first came to understand it through the stories I was hearing from people on the road when I was, uh, started my first term as Surgeon General under President Obama. And in that time, like, people would come up to me in these town halls and they wouldn't say, you know, hi, my name is Manny, I'm lonely, or I'm Vivek, I'm lonely. They would say things like, <clears throat> you know, I feel like I have to carry all these burdens in my life by myself. Or I feel if I disappear tomorrow, nobody would even care. I feel invisible. And what struck me, Manny, is I was not just hearing this from people who were older, uh, you know, in age, who were living by themselves, whose family members may have not been able to visit them. I was hearing this from college students. I was hearing this from 
parents who lived around lots of other folks. I was hearing this from CEOs. I was hearing this from members of Congress who in hushed tones behind closed doors would tell me that they too were struggling with loneliness but couldn't really talk about it. And so it reminded me of two, two things actually. One was my own life where as a child I had struggled mightily with loneliness and you know, and I never talked about it, even though I had like parents who loved me unconditionally, and I knew that without a, you know, a doubt. I never told them that I was struggling because I was ashamed. I thought that to be lonely was to be not likable. Just Where did that loneliness come from? I think it came, it's a good question, Annie. I think it came from the fact that I was intensely shy. And it wasn't that I didn't want to be with other people, I actually really did. Um, but I didn't know quite how to approach them. I was, I worried that I would get rejected if I asked to like hang out with somebody or sit with them in the cafeteria and they said no. Um, and so that intense shyness made it tougher for me, but I, I really wanted uh, to hang out uh, with other people. Is this resonating for people? Have people felt this? Nod your head at this kind of, you, yeah, okay. This so, feels like a common feeling. Yeah, and I wish that there were somebody like Manny to ask that question to my classmates when I was in elementary school because. <laughs> And here's why. Because I would have been your friend. I would have Thank totally you. taken you I in. I appreciate that. Put him in my lunch, buddy. Yeah. 100%. But the thing is, like, this is like the irony about experiencing loneliness is most people think they're the only ones, right? And in school, I thought I was the only one. In years that followed, though, I actually have talked to many of my classmates who, who have said, oh, yeah, I was feeling the exact same way. I was also feeling like I was, something was wrong with me. I, didn't, I felt too embarrassed to say something. There's a shame that comes with loneliness, with that sense of isolation that's deeply corrosive. It eats away at our sense of self-esteem, at our sense of self-worth. And shame is just something we have to grapple with because it can eat us away. And the question that I think about often is how do we break that cycle? Because the more shame you feel, the less worthy you feel, which makes it harder to interact and engage with other people, which is why loneliness is a downward spiral. But the other thing, Manny, that these stories I was hearing in Surgeon General reminded me of were my experiences as a doctor, seeing patients over the years. And nobody in medical school told me that I would encounter loneliness. I never took a class on it. I never took a, uh, you know, it was taught how to have the conversation with the patient about their isolation. But as soon as I set foot in the hospital as a third year medical student, I started seeing it. Patients coming in by themselves, uh, often having to make very difficult medical decisions on their own. And sometimes I would ask them like, you know, we're gonna have a really difficult conversation here. And, do you want me to call somebody to be with you so we can think through, so you, we can think through this together? And they would say, I, I wish there is some, was somebody, but there isn't. Yeah, so that's I'll just like, have the combo alone. That's the hardest thing. Like, has anyone gotten sick and had just the flu and they've, they're in a moment where they don't have necessarily like a partner or a family member to call in? And it almost makes it like twice or three times as bad because you don't have someone to come and, and bring you chicken soup or whatever. I, I actually got back together with an ex-boyfriend because... <laughs> I got sick and he wasn't there. And I was like, we're gonna need to get back together. <laughs> Just for this moment, which was not a good decision. I do not recommend doing that. So Manny's story tells you how strong the drive is for human connection, <laughs> right? We are hardwired to connect with one another and we will do all kinds of things to make it happen. <laughs> and I, I say this actually seriously because when I was researching and writing about loneliness, some of the folks I interviewed were actually gang members who had been incarcerated for many, many years and they had finally gotten out. When I talked to them about their experiences, I said, why do you think you joined the gang in the first place? It wasn't because they were not aware that it was dangerous, that illegal things were happening. They knew all of those things better than any of us do. But they said, interestingly, both of them to a T, they said, we were lonely and the gang gave us a way to belong, even if it was dangerous, even if it put our lives at risk. It just tells you just how fundamental that drive is for us to connect with other people. So I guess my question to you, you know, and after this, I want you to explain to folks what exactly the Surgeon General does. People, you're a very famous Surgeon General. You're, how many people have seen him on CNN or, you know, on MSNBC everywhere. or everywhere, right? You see him on television. Remember, I started this, he is a looker. So there's probably a little bit of a reason. But so you're a particularly famous Surgeon General, but I think most of us would could probably use an explanation of what exactly it means to be the Surgeon General. But most hearing you speak right now, um, I think we all agree that it's a problem. But as the nation's top doctor, you know, how do you act, how would you prescribe addressing this issue? What's your plan and your vision as, as the person looking after the collective health of the nation to deal with this problem? Well, it's a really good question. And I get this question a lot because this is not the typical issue that people in my position have taken on. You know, typically we deal with tobacco 
with physical activity, with nutrition. And those are all very, very important, don't get me wrong. But one of the things I've come to realize is that this is the fundamental issue that's eroding the foundation of society. That if we do not have strong connections with one another, if we don't have trust, if we don't have a sense of community, it doesn't matter how good our vaccines are for COVID or how good our therapeutics are. It's difficult to get people to understand or to accept any, any of those things if they can't trust, you know, if they don't feel like they are deeply connected to other people. And also, it doesn't matter how good our medicines are for heart disease and everything else. One of the things I came to learn in my time as a doctor and as who's written many prescriptions for many medicines over the years is that medicines and technology can do a lot uh, to help us get better, but healthy relationships always heal. And all of us have the power to build these relationships in our lives, not only for our own well being, but for others. And so part of what I want to do as Surgeon General to address this, and part of what I need your help doing, is to build a broader movement in our country to engineer the social revival that we need to counter the social recession that we're in. And how do we build that revival? Well, we do it first by looking at our own lives and asking ourselves, where are we putting our time, attention, and energy? Are we directing that toward the people in our life or is something else guiding us? Is work driving us? And I will be honest that in my own life, I came to realize through this work and during the pandemic that I was leading a fairly work-centered life and that I was fitting people in where it was convenient, but I wasn't truly leading a people-centered life. Uh, and there was like little things, right? So when somebody would call and when I didn't have time, because I was like in the middle of work, I would no, just- Running the country's medical system. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I would do sometimes, I would just silence it and then later I would text and say, hey, sorry, I can't, I couldn't, couldn't chat right now. What I realized is that it took less time, in fact, to pick up the phone and say, hey, can I, can I call you back later? I'm so excited to hear from you, but I'll call you back later. The power there is actually could hear their voice. They could hear my voice. There's, because again, we are hardwired to connect, even a short amount of interaction can go a long way. Uh, is, as long as you can hear someone's voice, see, their, see them in person, it's very, very powerful. So the bottom line is that at an individual level, there are changes that we can make about prioritizing the people in our lives. And we can talk more about that today if you'd like. But the second thing uh, that we can do is think about it at an institutional level. Like people spend a lot of their lives in workplaces and in, in educational institutions. Can we design these institutions to actually support healthy human connection? And we don't often, we think of that as a nice to have, but I will tell you in the workplace, there are good studies now showing that when people feel connected to others in the workplace, they are more productive, they're more creative, they tend to stay in the institution and they actually have a positive impact on the people around them in terms of their mood and their output. So these are some things that we have to do to build this broader movement, but it is a movement that we have to build. And it's not one that will get built by itself. It's gonna take people like all of us. If I can just ask a quick uh, follow-up to that, which is, does, does the move towards remote work worry you then? Or do you feel like there's a way to continue to establish that human connection over digital tools? Yeah. <laughs> Now, remember what I spoke about last time <laughs> we were sharing a stage. So, so here, here's what I think. Look, over thousands of years, we evolved to interact in person. That we did, right? That means that it's not just about understanding the words that are coming out of somebody's mouth. It's about hearing the tone. It's about seeing their facial expressions, about reading their body language. These are things that you can get closer to through digital technology. But as we're all experiencing right now, it's just different, right, when you're in person. So there's an important... I think it's important to preserve and to get back to as much in person as we can. With that said, I do think that there is an important role for remote work when it comes to giving people the flexibility to prioritize family and other people in their lives. Like a lot of times employers will ask uh, me in our office, like, why is it that folks are quitting? Why, why aren't they coming back to work? Is it all about pay? And it's not all about pay, right? Many people have experienced the opportunity to be with family, to drop their kids off at school, to like be there to prepare dinner for their, their kids. And, and they want to retain that engagement with family. And if that means that you work home from home for a couple of days a week or that you do partial days you know, in the office and other times you're working from remote at home, that's okay You know, if it allows you to maintain and, and support the relationships that matter to you in your life. To me, that's an example of the shift we have to make toward being a people-centered society as opposed to a society that has largely, I think over the years, become a work-centered society. And look, this is so tied to what we deem to be the source of self-worth that, that all of us have, right? Like I have kids who are four and five uh, years old. 
Um, there that was an unexpected bark from the right side of the room. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it as a vote of agreement. Hello, from, uh, yes. Our, our, our canine friend. So here's the thing, look, my kids are, are small. They're four and five. And just out of curiosity, do, how many people here have kids in your life? Nephews, nieces, friends, kids, people, kids who are important to you in your life? I have seven. Right? Seven, amazing. Not children. <laughs> okay. <laughs> nieces and nephews. Nieces and nephews. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> so here's the thing. Okay. All of us want like our children to grow up to be happy and fulfilled. But my worry is that the message that our children are getting from modern society today is that to be happy, you have to be successful. To be successful, you have to be powerful, wealthy, or famous, or some combination of those things. But how many of us know people who are powerful, wealthy, or famous, or all three, and are profoundly unhappy? I know many people like this. By contrast, I know many people who have none of those things, but are extraordinarily happy. And the common denominator between them is they have fulfilling relationships in their lives. This is what I kept seeing again and again in the hospital, is that the patients who were the happiest were the ones who had extraordinary relationships. And the reason I know that is because they would tell me, right? At the end of their, I've, I've had the privilege over the years of caring for patients at the end of their lives and being able to sit next to them at their bedside when they're sharing those final reflections in those final days. And I'll tell you what none of them talked about in those final moments were how big their bank account was or how many followers they had on Instagram or how, what their, how big their corner office was. What people talked about in those final moments when only the most meaningful threads of life remain is they talked about their relationships, the ones that brought them joy, the ones that broke their heart, the ones they wish they had spent more time with. My belief is we don't have to wait until the end of life, though, to learn what they love. We can choose to prioritize our relationships now, and we can choose to model that for our children because what our kids need to know is that their self-worth comes not from wealth, power, and fame. Their self-worth comes from their God-given natural ability to give and receive love. That is where Yeah, that is amazing. Isn't it so awesome that the Surgeon General is saying this? Because I'm like, I know smoking kills, but like, this is what I want to hear. It, we were talking, again, back to our kitchen moment. We were talking about the last two years and reflecting on what's happened. And I told you that actually the last two years, I've, for the first time in my life, I actually have a supportive group of friends. And it was because in the first months of the pandemic, and I don't know how many other people feel this way, when like you can't go out, right? You can't like distract yourself with, with places to go or things to do. You really have to look at yourself and be like, who is my community? Who can I call on? Who can I play, you know, cards on Zoom with? And I looked at myself and I was like, wow, I have this business and I know all these people, but like, I don't have a group of friends that like, that are really my people. And so I made a concerted effort over the last few years to build that network. And it's, it's allowed me to feel a lot more rooted and emotionally stable. And so I feel like you, I didn't need you to diagnose me with this, but you did. And I, and I feel like I listened to you. So I feel like I got a gold star from the Surgeon General. Well, you did really so well. Uh, Did I do okay, doctor? Mary, can we find a gold star to give Manny? Thank okay. you. I want a lollipop. <laughs> I just want a lollipop um, and a gold star. So, well, can I do what well, you said is really important, Manny. And I just, I want to use Manny's story to illustrate something, which is that like in a society, in a life that's moving like faster and faster and faster, right? And that's what the modern world is doing. Our relationships are getting left behind. So sometimes we have to be intentional about how we create them, right? And I'll tell you that when I finished my first term as a Surgeon General, I was, um, I was profoundly lonely. I had spent two and a half years completely throwing myself into work, telling myself what turned out to be a inaccurate narrative that I needed to devote all of my time to work because it's a once in a lifetime opportunity and that would enable me to make more impact. What that meant is I spent less time with friends. Even the time I did have with family, I was on devices, doing email, doing this, that, and the other. And the truth is in the end that actually made me less productive because I was, my emotional tank was empty and it, I needed my friends and family to fill it. But I came out feeling profoundly alone. And I remember really struggling without a sense of community and just not without a sense of direction. And I remember meeting with a friend up in Boston who said to me, she said, you know, Vivek, you know what your problem is? She said, your problem is not that you don't have friends. 
said, your problem is you're not experiencing friendships. She said, those people are still there. Just like a lot of us have latent friendships that we may not, you know, they may become dormant over time, but they are actually still have the ability to be reawakened. So I thought about what she said. And a few weeks later, I was getting together uh, for this fellowship retreat where I saw two friends who are dear, dear friends. I love them very much, but I didn't see them very often. We lived in different cities and we would always say, hey, we should see each other more often, but how often do we all say that to our friends and then we never see them, right? So this time I said, you know what, let's, maybe we can do something different. So at the end of that walk, we took this walk around the lake and this is in- um, It's a in, random lake or? This is a- Is this a lake in DC? No, no, no. no. This is actually in Colorado Springs okay. where our, our retreat was. I'm and, trying to paint the picture oh, yeah, in my yeah. mind. All right, there's a lake. There, there's this beautiful lake and it's, it's surrounded by these trees. It's very, very peaceful. And I'm enjoying a peace that I have not felt in like a year and a half, uh, honestly. Um, because of the process, you know, of, of ending my first uh, time was also like an unexpected one. You know, I was, uh, it, which I'm happy to talk about, but yes, it was- You were of, dismissed. Uh, yeah, so I was as appointed by President Obama and the Surgeon General serves in a, what's called a term position, which means that you can carry over from one administration to another. You have a four-year term, but it's up to the discretion of each president to determine who they want. So President Trump had decided that he wanted his own Surgeon General and so uh, had asked me to step down. Um, and ultimately, you know, I was terminated by the president. So, but it happened very suddenly. So I didn't know it was gonna happen. And so I had to quickly kind of process all this stuff. I didn't even get to say goodbye to my team, which had become like my family. So like, it was all like very, very traumatic. So- I feel like we all had a lot of trauma <laughs> in that moment. Not that it was less important. I mean, it's a different kind of trauma. Uh, different, you don't know. Yeah. But so uh, this is the first time I felt a sense of peace. And I was like, how do I hold on to this peace? And so I said to them, in that moment, we got to do something different. And so we decided to create something called a Moai. And many of you, some, some of you may be familiar with this. This is an Okinawan tradition where, or, you know, the, we, dating back to, you know, historically, is they would bring together a small group of young people, six, seven, eight people, and they would make it, they would say, you, you are all your, each other's people now. We're explicitly, you're making a commitment to one another. You're going to be there for one another, take care of one another. So we said, let us build our own Moai. Let's make an explicit commitment that we're gonna be there for one another. And here's what that means. It means once a month, we're gonna video conference with each other for two hours, and we're not gonna do other things when we do that. The second thing is we're gonna make it a point to talk about the stuff that really matters to us that we don't talk to friends often enough about. And that includes our health, our finances, and the things that scare us. And the third thing we said is that in between, if we have moments where we're scared or uncertain or moments of joy, and we wanna share with one another, we're going to have a text thread and we're going to commit to responding, you know, uh, in a timely way to each other. That Moai changed my life. And it did so because when I had to make critical work decisions, when I was struggling, you know, with, uh, with friendships and relationships and family difficulties, this is the group uh, that I was able to turn to at times, you know, and over time I came to, to recognize that my other friends really were there, as my friend in Boston had said, and I was able to reawaken some of those friendships. But the bottom line is uh, it took intentionality. And so that, that's not a bad thing. I know sometimes like we think, well, it should just happen. We should just like find the friends we want, find the romantic partners we want. But in this world uh, where relationships are too quickly being swept away by modern life, being intentional about reclaiming those powerful, powerful relationships is more important than ever. Well, I would like to challenge all of you along with my friend, the Surgeon General to, if you don't already have your Moai, uh, to try to set, spend the next few weeks trying to create your own and be intentional about it because you shouldn't just assume it happens. Um, Actually, can I just ask you, how many people just by show of hands, if you were to think about the challenge that Manny just posed of building your own Moai, how many people have at least like one person in mind who you think it would be great to have an explicit commitment to be, to be there for each other in your life? Well, a lot of people. Oh, you, and both of you renew for each other. Each oh, other. That's amazing. Amazing. Guys, we have our first, first Moai. Well, amazing. Your first Moai. <laughs> amazing. I, uh, a lot of you might know, probably, maybe you do or maybe you don't, but this past November, I had a pretty, I got a cancer diagnosis. It was very scary. And I was told basically by the doctors that like I got, had a year to three years left. Nuts. And then I had a bunch of tests done. And a few days later, they were like, actually, never mind. You do have cancer, but it's harmless and it won't affect you at all. Oh and it was such a it was such a jarring experience that you know, obviously something like that really affects you. And one of the commitments I made in November was every Friday, 
um, I would have a lunch conversation with someone at the same table at the same restaurant. And the rule was that we couldn't talk about work or have any agenda. The purpose was just to really connect with another human being. And so every Friday at 1230, I have this lunch conversation with a different, interesting, fascinating person for no purpose other than to just really connect with that person. And I've done it every week, practically since I got the diagnosis. And it's been the most rewarding thing I've done. So I highly recommend if you, while you establish your Moai, also think about what are some ways that you can build into your every week to just deeply connect with another human being. What does a Surgeon General actually do? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, when I'm walking through airports, a lot of people think I fly planes. <laughs> All the time. Do you asked, fly planes? I don't. Okay. And that's you seem like one of those people that like knows Russian, <laughs> like <laughs> can like defuse a bomb probably. <laughs> like no, no, you do not want me flying your plane. So no, but wait, here's what the surgeon general does actually. Um there are two primary jobs. The one is to oversee the United States Public Health Service Commission Corps. That's one of the eight uniformed services in the US government, and the only one that's entirely dedicated to health. So we have 6,000 officers that include nurses, doctors, physical therapists, pharmacists, environmental health officers, and many others. And it, they work in public health roles each and every day, but during times of emergency, we deploy them to respond. Uh, we did so during COVID, you know, they helped run vaccination events, testing centers. During 9-11, we sent many officers to New York City to help. During Ebola, we sent hundreds of officers to Liberia to actually stand up the Monrovia Medical Unit. Um, but the other job, which is better known of the Surgeon General, is to engage with the public and provide the public with information about health based on science that people can use to improve their lives. Now, if that sounds like a very vague, general, broad type of you know, charge, it is, which is why you see different surgeons general will actually approach the job very differently you know, based on what their particular uh, interests are, based on what um, you know, their past experiences have been and what approaches they like to take. Like in my case, <clears throat> I was not the most likely person to be asked to serve as surgeon general for many reasons. Um, one is I was about 30 years younger when I was first uh, you know, nominated by President Obama than typical surgeons general. I think I was 36 years old at the time. And the other reason is that I didn't have a traditional background, right? Like I had, sure I had done, you know, I had done research, I had worked on vaccine development, I had done all this stuff. And I was working clinically at the time, but I was also building a startup technology company. I was building an advocacy organization because I wanted to get more healthcare providers involved in advocating for better healthcare, you know, for people who didn't have access to healthcare. Like these were not typical things uh, to do, but it was what I was excited about doing. So I was, you know, I was surprised to get the call when I did, but <clears throat> for me, like it's been just an extraordinary opportunity to serve because, um, you know, my father and mother always brought me up uh, to believe that service was just has to, it's something that has to be part of our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, it was what they modeled. Uh, you know, they didn't tell us so much as they lived it uh, and told us that it was important. But even despite all of that, um, you know, it was, I was not a, it was not an expectation of mine that I would have this opportunity to serve. And I still remember the day that uh, then Vice President Biden swore me in uh, when I was looking out at the crowd that had gathered there and looking at my mother and my father, my grandmother in her wheelchair, my sister, I was thinking about the people who came before them, about my parents' parents who had struggled so hard uh, in India, uh, hoping that they build a better life for their children. I was thinking about my paternal grandfather who was a poor farmer who grew coconuts and mango and tamarind uh, in India. Uh, and didn't have enough money to even pay for shoes or slippers for his children after his wife died. And somehow my father and mother made it uh, out of India. They came to the United States with a hope uh, of building a life for their kids where we would be judged not by the color of our skin or our caste or the fact that we had a funny sounding name, but where we'd be judged by our ideas, our willingness to work hard, our willingness to contribute to a community. And even though we you know, encountered our share of uh, of racism and, and other challenges growing up, I was blessed to find public school teachers who looked out for me, even though I was the shy kid, you know, in the corner uh, at the back of the room. I was grateful over time to find friends in public school who supported me. We had neighbors who looked out for us. Uh, and, you know, I was, again, it was a surprise to be asked to serve. But on that day, I remember thinking that there are a few countries in the world where the grandson of a poor farmer from India could be asked to look out 
for the entire health of the nation by the president, and I'm grateful to live in Ottawa. I have to ask you, you were the Surgeon General during Zika and Ebola, which at this point, not to belittle those very serious things, but I'm like, girl, I would take Zika any day right now from what we had to deal with. And you were uh, the Surgeon General when President Obama was really banging the drum on the opio opioid crisis, which of course still rages in this country. Uh, and you served as a Surgeon General during the COVID uh, pandemic, which is still not over as we know, but uh, we're all hoping it is in its waning hours. You delivered uh, President Biden's COVID briefing directly to him. So I just have to, I want to ask you what it was like, if you can, maybe and give us a couple um, or one or two memories or experiences from being in, in this position during the COVID crisis that, that, that come to mind right now. Because I think for a lot of us, we did experience this in, in, in our own bubbles, but you experienced this pandemic in a whole nother way. So what was it like being the Surgeon General during this pandemic? Well, you know, it's interesting, having had the experience before to compare it to, you're right. I mean, like if only COVID had been uh, what Zika and Ebola were in terms of, uh, you know, relatively lower threats to the American public. To, you know, I was a civilian. I was, you know, a private citizen when I was during the first year of the crisis. And then after President Biden took office and I was serving as SG, I had the, the privilege of serving during the second year of the, of the COVID crisis. And look, it, it, was, it was really difficult in a lot of ways because we were seeing people and I was seeing people around the country who were really suffering, people who had lost loved ones who didn't know how to keep uh, their other loved ones safe who were worried about their children, uh, especially when a vaccine wasn't available for many kids. And even still, we have don't have vaccines available for kids like my daughter who are under five. Um, and seeing that fear, that worry that people have was, was, it was incredibly painful because the worst feeling I think to have is to not be able to protect your loved ones, right? And the fact that millions of people were experiencing that was, um, was, was really heartbreaking. But I think the other challenge is that we were dealing with um, a virus that we were still learning about, right? And since still are uh, to this day. And in the beginning, especially, you know, we didn't have nearly as many people vaccinated. We didn't have an arsenal of medicines that we felt confident actually worked uh, to address uh, the virus. So we had limited tools and a virus that was spreading like wildfire. And in those moments, um, it's tough because you're trying to figure out how do I be helpful? How do I reassure people uh, and also just be honest about the fact that there's still a lot we don't know. And it reminded me a lot of doctoring, you know, like this is what we had to do, have to do as doctors is you don't always have all the answers. You don't always know the diagnosis, even if you don't always have the treatments, but you don't have the option to just cut and run and just not be there. You got to show up. You got to stay at the bedside. You got to sit through uh, the uncertainty with your patient. And that's what I felt like we had to do. It was tough. You know, it was, um, it was certainly not as tough for, for me as it was for the families out there who were dealing with uh, people who they lost. You know, in my family, we lost 10 individuals to, to COVID-19, um, most in India and several here in the United States. But it was all before vaccines were widely available. And I still like, think so often, like, and so and wish so much that they had been alive to at least see a vaccine, have the chance to get it, because they would have gotten it, you know, and I think their lives would have been saved, but that wasn't in the cards. So this has been a tough, tough road. And, and that's why part, part of what I, I worry about is that, you know, if we don't recognize that this has been a traumatic experience for the country, and if we don't treat it as trauma, I worry that we will rush right back into what we think is gonna be the post pandemic world. We'll snap back to 2019. And we need to process what happened. We need to talk about what happened. We need to deal with what we lost, which is not only our loved ones at times, but we lost relationships. We lost jobs in some cases. We lost our dreams and hopes. Many people were not able to get married or be at the bedside when their loved ones died. Like people made enormous sacrifices and endured great loss. So as a country, as communities across the nation, we have to find ways to talk about that, to process it. And finally, to do what I think is perhaps more important than ever, which is to figure out how we come out of this pandemic stronger than before it began. And to me, at the heart of that is not just thinking about how do we prepare for the next pandemic in terms of science and technology and communication, 
It's about ensuring that our relationships and the communities that we live in are stronger than ever before. Because it turns out those relationships are what help us buffer stress. The trust that's engendered in healthy relationships also helps us during a pandemic. Because otherwise, instead of coming together during times of difficulty, we splinter, uh, we come apart. And that is sadly what we've seen happen, especially during the later months of the pandemic. Thank you. Before we get to my last question to you and the audience questions, I do want to just take a second and thank the members of the press that are in the audience. I think we have Channel 2 with Amber Lee, KTVU. Thank you very much. Uh, we have CBS, Channel 5, if I'm not mistaken. We have Channel 7, I think, ABC. And then we also have Telemundo uh, here as well. So thank you to the press for covering this. Did I miss a station? No, I got them all. Great. Um, so thank you, local, you know, support your local news and watch, I um, think we'll be on tonight. And thank you for the press for being here. Thank you, Amber. Um, also, you can take photographs of us. And if you do, please tag the Surgeon General and at Welcome to Manny's and share your experience tonight. Um, you know, hearing you talk, I, I, you know, I wanted to ask you how you think the pandemic has affected the way the average American thinks about the medical establishment and doctors and science. I mean, I don't think I thought about vaccines and about the importance of scientific innovation um, very much before the pandemic. And I think we all were reading what the latest FDA, you know, approvals were going to be of this vaccine. And we were like with bated breath, wondering and hoping that we could get this. So you are the nation's top doctor. And my last question to you before we get to audience question is how, when this is all said and done, and let's hope that is soon, how do you think this is going to affect the way the American people think about medicine, medical professionals, your profession, uh, and the importance of science? Uh, these are incredibly important questions. I think it is true that people paid much closer attention to science, medicine, and public health during this pandemic than perhaps at any other time in our lifetimes. Um, just to give you an example of it, before vaccines were actually made available to the public at various stages, there would be an FDA advisory committee meeting called the VRPAC meeting. And then there would be a CDC advisory committee meeting called the ACIP meeting. And not only did so many people know these acronyms, but they were logging in real time to watch the meetings in like <laughs> tens of thousands of people. We're like, oh my God, this is extraordinary. Um, <laughs> it's a huge interest for science. But on the flip side, my worry is that for many people, uh, while some people's trust and faith in science was strengthened during this pandemic as they saw vaccines and treatments become available and they benefited from them. For other people, I believe their, their trust was damaged because, and part of this had to do with the fact that there's been a tremendous amount of misinformation that has floated around. Part of that, uh, which is, I think, made people confused and also made them wonder about whether the, what they were hearing from doctors and scientists was accurate or not. I think the other thing that's happened is that the process of science has happened out in the open, which in general is a good thing. But when you have rapidly evolving data, and you have experts publicly talking about that data and shifting and adjusting their opinion based on new data, without context, that can be confusing. And some people will look at it and say, wait, these experts said one thing yesterday, now this week they're saying something else, and half of them don't seem to agree with each other. Do these people really know what they're talking about? And the truth is, like people within the world of science know that that's actually what happens. And you hammer out you know, through a lot of good discussion and honest analysis of data what uh, you know, a general good opinion is on, in terms of a recommendation. But without context, that could be really confusing. So, you know, I do worry that we, uh, in some cases, have lost ground, you know, on that trust, and then we've got to build that uh, up over time. And, and the way we do that, I think, is one like we've got to continue to be open and transparent and clear and consistent in our communication with people about what the science says, about what we know and what we don't know. I think we also have to empower local messengers, local nurses, doctors, public health leaders, and others. Um, because sometimes those voices, I would say more often, those voices are far more important than the voices from uh, the federal government that you may see on TV, uh, myself included, myself in particular. So I think, you know, we've got to empower those, those groups. And that's partly what we try to do by building the COVID-19 Community Corps to actually strengthen and lift up those, those local voices. So we've got a lot to do there. But I, finally, there's a piece around literacy, around digital health literacy that we really have to build in our country. You know? And look, I don't blame people for being confused about what they read online. It is very confusing sometimes. And sometimes what's different between the flow of misinformation now and let's say 10, 15 years ago is this, the speed and the scale and the sophistication with which misinformation spreads is really unprecedented. And so sometimes it's hard to tell what's real and what's not. So 
we have a lot of work to do here. It's one of the reasons that last year I issued a Surgeon General's advisory on health misinformation and why um, you know, we'll continue to work on that issue. But um, a lot of this comes back to trust, right? In order for any society to function effectively, whether it's in responding to a pandemic or whether it's building its healthcare system to truly serve everyone, there has to be trust you know, between individuals and between individuals and government. And that actually is the factor that seems to have been most important in determining which countries actually did best with COVID. It's not how much money they had, it's how much trust they had between individuals and between the individuals and government. Mm, that last point kind of stings, doesn't it, a little bit? <laughs> that stings a bit. But, um, you know, I think we're going to look back and there's going to be a lot of positive lessons learned and a lot of reflections 